it didn't smell. Okay, that, that was the story. <laughs> well, that's good, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then 100 years later, we say, no, that was a mistake. Should we actually be doing more cars or should we do more public transportation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So uh, if you if you look at every policy, whether it's the OECD or, or, the, or the UN, they, they're based on the methods we have today. I love that. Uh, I will push the awesome button for that because I think that it's very important what you're saying here, that we actually can contribute. But you can also get lithium from South America. And now we're talking, okay, where did it come from? Did it come from uh, an environment that was all safe and, and community and stuff like that? How did they extract it? And then what's the carbon footprint of the lithium being on the ship from South America all the way to Sweden? Welcome to The Switch, not just another podcast, but a platform where we educate you, where we entertain you in order to make sure that you are a part of the switch that we need to do to a greener, better and more balanced planet. We have the pleasure of interviewing people that are actually doing something that, want, that we want to be inspired by. And uh, we are so happy to have a very special guest with us today. But I'm not going to tell you yet who he is before I am going to say hi to my amazing producers behind the scene. Hey guys! Hello! Hello! All good? Yeah, we're all good. We're oh. excited for another episode. So am I. Yeah. But I'm a bit stressed because he's a Liverpool fan. Oh, and you aren't? No, I'm a Manchester United fan. So we'll see how this goes. Hey, we maybe have a problem as well then. Oh, do I have <laughs> exactly. a problem with my producers. Damn, I should have said anything. Yeah, she's rising. <laughs> well, I'm changing the topic. Uh, if you like this episode, if you're already intrigued, make sure that you share it, subscribe it. And with that said, let's roll into introducing our guest of today. He is graduated in geology and mining engineering and spent many years working in mining operations, engineering consulting and business consulting. For the last two decades, he has fostered business transformation and technology information across the industry to drive business excellence and growth. He currently coordinates the mining and metal practice for at EY, Ernst & Young, for both Canada and the Americas. Theo has done work on all continents, combining his business and technical skills. A professional engineer in Ontario, Theo holds PhD in rock mechanics from École Polytechnique de Montréal and a Master of Business Administration with distinction from University of Oxford. Welcome to The Switch, not just another podcast, Theo. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So am I. I had the pleasure of meeting you. It was about uh, six months ago where we were together at the Energy Disruptors and you intrigued me with all your knowledge in uh, metal and mining. So I just decided that we need to have this dude on our show because he can tell us how the world works. Uh, I'll have an idea of how the world works. So I'll, I'll do my little contribution. I like the show. I like the fact that you... Uh, debunking the mysteries of how the world was and uh, you know I'm happy to be a contributor today. Good I'm happy to. Before we get started Thea I just wanted to tell you a little bit how this works. We've already talked so you know uh, make sure that we educate and entertain. If you feel that I'm bullshitting you you can also push this button and that's completely fine. I might use it I probably also will use the awesome button uh, when we learn something new or when I think that something you say is really cool. So feel free to use them as well in order for us to really get an engaging and fun conversation. Are you ready to kick it off? Yeah, I'm ready. Good. Listen, we wanted to get to know you in the beginning a little bit more. So I actually wanted to start by asking you a couple of questions from the wheel of questions. Are you ready for that? Yes, I'm ready. Wheel of questions. Mm -hmm. 
What makes you laugh? Oh, I like uh, I like to laugh about basically human inconsistencies. So I'm a big fan of uh, stand-up comedy. So I love when somebody looks at the world and basically shows us how inconsistent or illogical or intriguing the humans are across the world. And you know, when you when you watch stand-up comedy, it doesn't matter if you understand the language. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. It's always I agree with you. Who who is your favorite uh, personality within a comedian? Well, I have many, but uh, the one that I always love to is always going to be Chris Rock. I want to roll into a little bit of these questions that um, I'm very eager to understand. And when I was preparing this, I was going into a lot of details. But then I realized when I talked to you that there's so much to metal and to mining that we don't know. And we don't understand 100% the scoop of the effect it actually has for us. So I would actually like to start there. Like, what role does metal and mining sector play in the world? Well, first of all, there's a lot of confusion uh, when people talk about mining. I've, I've heard, um, you know, during COP, how some of the leaders of the, of the world talk about mining. Uh, there's different commodities. That's the first thing we need to understand is that the commodities are different. It's like somebody talking about transportation and confusing bicycles with airplanes. Mm. So in the commodities, there's different, you know, like the coal mining has nothing to do with really the like, uh, copper mining and stuff like that. Uh, yes, they're all digging it from the ground, but it's, it's, the use for society is different. So that's the first mix. And the second one is that, um, most of the time we talk about mining and then we separate metals are they different, but metals actually come from mining. Recycling doesn't produce enough to actually just produce enough metals. So metals and mining, which is how we call it at EY, is that that's the value chain. So that's the first thing. So always keep in mind, you know, like gold mining, a lot to do with diamond mining, there's separate se subsectors. The second one is that the civilizations, um, other than farming, civilization run on mining and metals. Um, I usually tell people the story of the, the ages, you know, like if you think about the ages, they're all mining related to mining and metals, right? So if you think about the stone age, that's basically, we're still doing some stone stuff whether it's for like, uh, you know, building houses, but also for like creating cement and, and things like, like industrial minerals, mm -hmm. what we call it today. And then you have, you have like the, the bronze age. Bronze is basically a mix of copper, again, copper impurities. And then you have the, the basically the iron age, you know, these are all like metals, right? So, and, and when you think, even when you think about uh, Europe in the 1800 and the development of an industrial world that was really anchored on coal mining. That was another big one. They, they, they two times the way we grew civilization without fundamentally doing mining. One is, uh, the oil and gas, uh, which was actually oil only, uh, in the early 1900s that propelled the United States into a new era of prosperity. Mm -hmm. And and also uh, the Silicon Valley uh, civilization. Some people still say, "Well, this is mining because you know the processors need like silica, uh, silicon, really." But it's not really true. So, so these times we didn't. But mining always been around. Like if you, you know, like uh, people hear about the Solomon gold mines um, that uh, like you know biblical uh, levels and. Um, and, you know, you can think about the pyramid. This needed to be somewhat chiseled out of quarries. These are all mining stuff. So civilizationally, I, I think people don't really grasp the value of metals and mining in maintaining civilization. So you mean that in every, every period where we found new metals, uh, that's when a new civilization grew out, grew? Or how do you, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so every time we, I don't know if we find the metal first or if we create the technology first. Sometimes technology, people think technology has to be like computers. We confuse technology with digital. Um, technology is just a way of doing things. So like uh, when when we figure out how to make the wheels, that's actually a technology in, in the anthropological terms, right? So 
every time we create either technology to make the life of humans better, or that we find a metal that we haven't used before, it propels civilization into a new era. Now, today, because we're so global, it makes an impact overall in the world, right? You know, mm -hmm. Because everybody, right away. But every time there's something, like right now, when you think about the, how do you call it, the catalytic converters that we use in the cars, like palladium, platinum, all this stuff, these are like, these are all metals right, that we figure out that we're using. And, and the low carbon economy with the, you know, lithium ion batteries, we need to mine lithium. Mm. You know, like, just sit there, it's not coming from trees. But we need to mine lithium, we need to mine a lot of it. And now we're struggling with, you know, what kind of batteries do we need? Do we need batteries with the iron? Or do we need batteries with like cobalt and uh, magnesium and nickel? But these are typical cycles of evolution. And they call it dominant design. We don't know the dominant design yet. Uh, you probably remember the days where, you know, we had DVD and Blu-ray, and then at some point, basically Blu-ray won, right? Yeah. So, so that's where we are right now with, with the battery electric uh, vehicles, but especially in the north, it's, it's big. There, it's bigger there than most places. But at some point, we'll figure out the dominant design, and then maybe nickel will go in second zone. Or maybe either LFP batteries will go in second zone. But this is it's civilizational, and it's great that we thinking about it, and it's great that we thinking about doing the switch hmm. because but humans did the switch. It's just that for some reason we tend to forget. How, all of this, like the history we have today and where we are today, how does it affect? How does metal and mining affect the world we know today? What would you say? Uh, I'll say it is. Uh, I said, as, as humans, we we never perfect. Okay, the, um, there was a paper, and I think it's actually a HBR paper that starts and talks about um, uh, the issue of horses in New York, okay, and how there was like uh, you know they were dying a lot. There was a lot of uh, mistreatment of horses and stuff like that. But back then, it was like the dominant design of transportation, and and then we created the car. When we created a car, people were actually super excited because uh, you didn't have to kill horses anymore. You had reliability, you know, and then it didn't smell. Okay, that, that was the story. <laughs> well, that's good, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then 100 years later, we say, no, that was a mistake, right? So it's, for me, when I, and I love civilization and history. So when I look at how the humans progress, sometimes we create something and we think it's fantastic. And then... 50 years later, we're like, no, that was actually a big mistake. We should stop doing that. So, so where we're going today as a, as a civilization means that there are some things we need to change. So in mining and metals, there are some things. So I usually talk about in-house, outside the house. If you think of the mining metal sector, so players in the mining metal sector, mm -hmm. there are things they need to fix. They need to think about like uh, tailings management because every time a tailings break, it kills a lot of people and destroys the environment. They need to think about reducing the amount of chemicals and the amount of water that we're using because it uses a lot of water. Uh, to make like, uh, you know, one gram of gold, there's a lot of water you need to use and a lot of waste you generate. So, and then uh, there's like communities, you need to think about being close to communities and have them participate. So these are examples of in-house money needs to fix itself to actually have um, not only a better brand, but also just doing the right thing. Okay. And then there's the outside. The outside is really what mining caters to, and that's when we're using mining product. And we were just talking, I, I, I you know, you guys just told me you, uh, you had a, um, Echo Data Center person talk about, you know, the value of uh, uh, energy when people are using digital tools like Instagram or even Facebook. So the outside one, the other, we as society around the world need to think about those details of what we're consuming for money. Okay? Uh, do we consume too much? Do we have even enough? Like people say, for example, we're not, we're not going to have enough lithium. Mm. Okay, not going to have lithium, should we actually be doing more cars or should we do more public transportation? Because at the end of the day, if we do more public transportation on um, like battery and then we become more of a social society, which is what we're supposed to be. 
chain will need less pearl, then we can actually deal with the shortage of lithium without having lithium prices go up to the roof and have it like a poor and rich society is coming up right in the future. Mm. And then there's other things like gold or diamonds, you know, do we really need to parade with diamonds and, you know, like, you know, you remember the stories of black diamonds and things like that. Most of the diamonds are used for people to, like, just give each other gifts and stuff like that. Do we really need them? You know, how do we, as a society, reduce the need for more mining and metal so that we can optimize it? So that's a... Do you that's mean... All do, do you mean, I mean, did, I want to go back to, to the question, like, how does it affect the world we know today? Do you mean that we're making decisions on moving forward in certain technologies, in certain strategies and so on, based on the metals and, and what we have today? Or do we find, is that, did I understand you correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So uh, if you if you look at every policy, whether it's the OECD or, or the or the UN, they they based on the metals we have today. Um, there was a, a company that actually set up an online competition like a hackathon to try to find new uses of current metals. We we never really think about the metals that we can find or the things that we can change. Um, you know, I was talking to my colleague uh, this week about this idea that, you know, what we see in uh, Black Panther with uh, vibranium, is that real? You know, is there like a metal like this? Maybe there is, I don't know, but are we looking for it? Maybe not. So yeah, we always making the decision based on what we have today, which actually creates a lot of stress on the resources we have today. Is there any resource, any metal you see uh, coming to an end that will actually make a major shift in the way we're living today? Uh, there's clear, well, it's not a metal, coal is considered just industrial, uh, but there's a clear trend that, uh, that the amount of coal we're going to use is going to kind of decline because we created um, lower cost other, like alternative energies that would make us reduce the coal, especially in the United States and the OECD countries. Uh, Asia still needs a lot of coal, but with time, they're also supposed to mm. go to get better uh, energy sources. Energy is really what consumes most of the metals and and, uh, and how we want the world to go forward. And something that, you know, was in Namibia uh, over the Christmas break, and you actually realize that, you know, all these other countries around the world they also want energy. I mean, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Africa, we didn't really have a fridge. And I see the value of a fridge because you can save product for longer, you waste less and all kinds of things. So the rest of the world, like I usually say, the average seven billion people, they will also need energy. So the sooner we can find better ways to make energy cheaper and more reliable, the better it's going to be for the world. And I think that, I mean, it's awesome if we, if you say that it's uh, going down with coal, that's also good for, for the energy, right? Because it's forcing and making sure that we're making better choices in a sense. So uh, that makes me happy to hear. Uh, when, when you and I talked before, you mentioned that um, coal and mining is on a geopolitical level. Can you explain what you mean with that? Locally, countries can decide to phase out coal. Uh, but globally, there's uh, lots of uh, trade around coal going on. And um, and coal is not just for heating up your house. So most of the time, people confuse thermal coal with metallurgical coal. They're both energy, but they're different. The metallurgical coal is actually used mostly to like, make steam. Mm. Right? And uh, Asia uses a lot of it. So typically, they're not going to be trying to reduce it. Now, we try to create our furnaces, which is usually different technology, but still early days. And and why is it a ge geopolitical issue is because um, when Europe were cut off the natural gas lines uh, uh, during the, the, begin uh, the early days of the war, you could see that everybody turned back into coal, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, the government will be afraid to have people on the street or have people vote them out because they, they, it's just too cold in the, in the houses and they don't have energy. So most of Europe refired some of the coal plants and the, the coal production from other countries also went up. Most of the coal companies made a lot of money 
in the last uh, 12 months hmm. because of political stuff. So the alternative is that we have a safer world, uh, more like a peaceful world, where access to the energy from the powerful countries is actually secure. We knew that the, the gas lines were going to come into Western Europe without restriction, then we wouldn't worry about it. But then at the same time, because we were doing it, um, and we couldn't then morally force the suppliers to actually, you know, do the right thing. Then we end up saying, well, maybe we should cut off the supplier. Hopefully they do the right thing because then they don't run out of money. So that's why it gets real political. How does like a mineral in uh, the northern part of Sweden that they're found, how can that change the geopolitical landscape and how can that Im impact our life today? So I, re I remember in Oxford, my uh, macroeconomic class where the professor used to take examples on potato, potato trade, and how farmers early on traded potatoes to get our products. So the world hasn't really changed. We just traded different things. So what you talk about, it's not a new mineral, it's a new deposit. It's really rare earth. Uh, rare earth is super critical in the low carbon economy because it's being used in um, um, electric vehicles and and, mag and uh, magnets and all sorts of digital technologies of the of the new world, like of the where we live today and the world we live in for the next 50. Hmm. Deposits are not really everywhere yet. It's called rare earth. It's actually not that rare. It's everywhere. There's not concentrated enough to make it uh, like mineable. So why was Sweden super excited about this deposit uh, last week? Last week or the week? Last week. Um, was because Europe doesn't have those deposits. And uh, up until that discovery, basically, if you think about, you know, the macroeconomics of the potato um, trade, is that Europe will have to trade something to get those minerals from somebody else. Okay, it could be the West, could be Canada, could be China, could be Australia. They have to trade. And in that trade, because you need more than the other one, than the other side, you may actually lose your shirt to the trade, basically, because you need it so bad for your economies. By discovering it, uh, they now say, well, you know, like, now we're kind of independent on, on rare earth, so we might be good. And uh, I'm super keen to see how that works all well, the discussion around NATO, um, NATO uh, joining NATO, because yeah, Sweden, Sweden, Sweden has a big rare earth deposit. Well, so it's basically yeah. going. It's basically going back to the gold mines. We found something that is considered gold, and that can actually shift the the yes. politics around it. That's super interesting. Uh, using this information, how will mining, mining and metals help governments and the nations of the world? do the shift? How can mining and minerals be a way out to a greener and better planet? Uh, it is already going that way, but remember what I said in the beginning, the commodities are all different. So some commodities are super critical. So if you think about economic development, uh, because we, we attain some prosperity without really paying attention, but copper, mm. okay? Electricity runs on copper. So if you want to electrify let's say Africa, uh, you need more copper. Hmm. You need lots of wires. You need to transport that electricity. You also need steel because all those pylons, you need to basically set them up. This is like, a, you know, high quality steel. So copper and steel are critical for just having economic prosperity and having, you know, TV in your house, internet, you name it, right? Hmm. And then, and then the other pieces that are also critical is like, uh, you know, the base metals, the zinc, uh, they're also part of all sorts of products that you use it. Where the switch happen is really how they make it. Okay. So I, I don't know if you recall, but I, maybe I don't know how it happened in Europe, but in North America, I remember the beginning when they started putting stickers in the appliances that tell you how much energy it's using so that you can make a choice. Yes. Of energy. Right? Hmm. So, in the near future, hopefully in the next two three years, where we have stickers of, you know, green levels, 
for people to pick and choose like appliances or housing or, or cars and whatever. But we need to have an agreement on how to make those uh, those metrics so that they're transparent and, and real. And that's that's where the challenge is really, like how to make it transparent and real. Um, so imagine there's a lot of steel in um, in the fridge, for example. Okay? Yes. Um, okay? So if you're buying, and I'm not going to name brands, but if you're buying one brand versus the other, but one brand actually made the steel or acquired the steel green, um, and you want to contribute to the switch, you should be picking that steel versus the one that actually doesn't have good uh, save the planet type of practices. Right? So that's where you... That's where you slowly help societies make the switch. The commodity will still be there, but how it was mined and transported and converted into the end product is where you you should actually make the choices. I love that. Uh, I will push the awesome button for that because I think that it's very important what you're saying here, that we actually can contribute. Something that is very, like... Uh, distant for us thinking of metal and, and mining is actually not so distant from us it's actually a choice that we can make here and now so thank you yep. for clarifying mm -hmm. that we have one additional question that we wanted to ask you theo can you mine with less effect on climate oh yeah 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 no like uh, listen as a mining engineer um depending on which company you work for where you are on the planet uh, you do. And, um, you know, for example, in Canada, you, you have to submit your mining plan and then the environment uh, department takes a look and sees if what you're doing is actually minimal footprint uh, mm -hmm. into, into the planet. And that affects the climate. So, for example, if you're going to clear a whole forest to create a big pit, well, that's less forest. And that's a problem. And that's probably less animals, less biodiversity, less water, whatever. So depending on the countries, uh, some rules are more stringent than others. Uh, I can tell you, for example, Quebec has some of the stringent rules on the planet, but it's because they want to protect the environment and 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 uh, and the fauna and, and everything else. So you do. And I think that's going to come down to a choice if we create some sort of transparency. Like we're already starting to create transparency on, like you know, way your vegetables and your fruits are coming from or where your meat is coming from. Yeah. We should for metals and mining so that um, if you if you buy an EV in Sweden, it'll be important if the consumer <coughs> and at EWA we call them prosumers now or professional consumer. It's it'll be important to consumer forces the E V company to tell them where did the parts of the metal paint come from. Yes. And what carbon footprint you have. Yeah. So for example, if you if you're getting lithium from um, I'll give a simple example um, from Europe. I'm not gonna name countries, but there's lithium in Europe. If you get lithium from Europe, you have you probably put it on the road. Maybe you put it on like a, on an electrical truck, okay? And it goes from somewhere in, in uh, mid eastern Europe straight into Sweden and then the company in Sweden makes uh, EV battery out of it, that's short. But you can also get lithium from South America. And now we're talking, okay, where did it come from? Did it come from uh, an environment that was all safe and, and communities and stuff like that? How did they extract it? And then what's the carbon footprint of the lithium being on the ship from South America all the way to Sweden? Mm. Is that a little lithium? No. So mining can be, there's, there's, Different ways for mining to be really like uh, climate friendly. There's a lot of effort being put into that. There's many mining companies that commit to like recirculate water that they're using so that they don't have to take fresh water. Uh, there's companies that do it so that they can uh, basically have a smaller footprint. I worked for a uranium mining company back in the day where we basically kept all the processing underground. So that we don't need to build like big facilities on surface and then we change all the process. Uh, there's a company, uh, in, um, Norway that is building the first, that's what the CEO says. I met him when I was in Stockholm last year. They're building the first fully renewable underground, um, copper company. So it's doable. It's just that the more it's like every industry is like the industry of the plastic or the grocery stores, the more we put pressure 
And then we get to a point where, okay, there's no single-use uh, plastic bags anymore in the grocery store, right? Mm. So society needs to participate. It's not, we can't let just the mining sector dictate how it goes. Mining sector also looking for feedback from society and changing things. So that definitely, that's, and that's what it should be in Mama. I like hearing that uh, uh, answer because it actually means that we can affect the situation today. So thank you very much. We're moving into the segment questions from the future. This is where our younger generation are posing questions to our uh, <laughs> guests. And this one is for you, Theo. Are you ready? Yes. Questions from our future. Who should pay for the better world? That's very, very deep. Um, oh, wow. So, so that's a that's a tough question. Again, I said I was in Namibia recently, and uh, Namibia went through climate change nine thousand years ago, and it's still going through the current climate change. But they had like a big shift which created the Namib Desert. And I was looking at you know I drove through great neighborhoods, but I also drove through very poor neighborhoods. Um, there's uh, some particular groups that are still living in desert, where people don't actually have access to just water for like shower every day mm. and they've actually changed their lives and started using like um, ochre some plants and flowers so that they don't need to shower because they don't have access to water um so you take that con we take that in the contrast to you know like uh, you know toronto for example and even if in toronto you have people that have minimal and then people have a lot and so who should pay? Well, when we created the UN as, as, a, as, a, as a planet after World War II, uh, we were supposed to make the world a better place. And I think we probably lost our way through it because mm. uh, look at the, some of the data that are coming out about how the, most of the CEOs made. Basically, what they made so far in the new year is how most workers would make by the end of the year. These are all inequalities on the planet that I think needs to be tackled today and then pay into the future. So what I'll say to, to the next generation is we need an international equality system where we actually redistribute the wealth because really there's like a minimum that people need to live and they don't need to have that much. And if it has an imbalance, we create revolutions, right? So the the safety of the world or the peace of the world requires that today we need to start paying for the future and we need to start setting up systems so that the future is a better place. We can't just hope that the future will fix itself. Well, Theo, my heart just started uh, pounding some extra leaps here just because what you said. I think that you are so spot on in what you're saying and just having uh, something, that's, uh, something that takes care of equality all over the world, that would make a difference. I, I think that you are uh, correct in what you just said. So thank you for elevating it to that level. All right, Theo, we are moving into... Um, Uncomfortable conversation. Does mining and metal have a bad reputation and why? Yes, mining and metals uh, is not a sector that is uh, here for, um, you know, like helping society because of different things that happened in the past. First of all, um, I said the commodities are different, right? So if you, if you think about every disaster we do, uh, it has an impact. So let's start with coal. Coal, for example, um, because it's a public, uh, it's a private enterprise, uh, mining metals typically, coal has created lots of issues with health over time. There's many movies about that. Uh, and, uh, workers, uh, basically dying after they retire. Um, then, um, then we also have coal with the, with the climate impact and the fact that coal is being used for thermal, um, needs. Uh, so coal tends in, especially in North America, coal tends to be the culprit. And when people talk, they think about coal. I even mean, when Big Chair is talked about, we have to stop mining, but I think he's talking about coal mining, but because, because whether he wants it or not, uh, when he goes to the company, he's taking a plane and that plane is full of metals that are actually not in the same, same well. 
Uh, the second thing that made that makes mining have bad reputation is, is on the on the environment uh, tailing uh, when they break. So as you know, about two thirds to eighty percent of the volume of what is being mined sits outside as waste. And um, and more than one, the tailings will will break. So they sit in a dam that is man made. And when the dam breaks, the tailings are uh, really full of chemicals and it destroy people, the environment, uh, the animals and everything. So that was also had a bad reputation because uh, there's no consistency international how we build the tailings or how we monitor them because I'm going to build them well, but the monitoring is different because of climate change. There's more rain and more earthquake and stuff like that. So that, that also participate in creating a bad reputation uh, for mining. There's a lot of people that are advocating for dry tailings as a solution. Uh, and then there's community. Uh, community is a big one because um, there's lots of private enterprises that really don't care about the community that operate. It's not all the mining companies, but the ones that do bad stuff do it so bad that they, they become so um, a negative for the rest of the sector. Mm. And, and uh, for communities, I can tell you, like recently, there's a the Nunavut uh, uh, communities who choose to expand production of iron ore in, in Nunavut because they felt that it will impact the caribou's and impact their lives. Of course, the mining companies may not be happy with it, but that's the that's position. Hmm. But this is what I say. But in other places, uh, mining companies will hire militias to help them continue mining, and that also drives a bad reputation. Uh, there's a lot of talk about cobalt and, 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 and uh, cobalt being mined by slave labor. By certain companies, not all the companies. And I had an interview with a media not long ago when I said, well, if you look at the top producers of the cobalt, most of them are Western companies, like uh, OECD country companies. So that they're not the one with the issue. You're just zoning on this one or two companies that are not listed in, in New York or Canada or Europe. And you're saying that, well, they're doing slave labor. Yeah, because there's some that do it and then they think everybody's doing it. So, there's uh, and then there's like um, tax breaks and all kinds of complications around like uh, transparency and transfers of funds and stuff like that. So I know all the reasons why uh, money has bad reputation, but we tend to bundle everybody in the same group and we're not thinking about the ones that are doing a great job. It's a bit like um, a bit like talking like let's think about it like think about airplane for example when the when that, uh, is that what, seven, seven, seven months, I think, when it crossed twice and we had to basically park them around the world. Mm -hmm. It didn't, all the planes were bad. It means that these ones were bad for this company, right? It wasn't like all the planes were bad. And the same comes with mining. There's like a great Swedish mining companies, for example, that are doing the right thing everywhere around the world. And we need to basically zone in on which one is what. We can't just say that, you know, just because we have, I don't know, they say it's 1%, maybe it's more. That's because we have 1% of psychopathic humans on the planet, all humans are bad people. So that's, that's how I look at it. That's true. Uh, I look at it as a, okay, but which one? We need not to say it's a sector, we need to pick and choose. And then we need to really punish the ones that are bad. Uh, punish being a hard word, but basically we need to take action so that we can get to the world a better place because we can't just leave the bad and the good together. I agree with you. I think that uh, that's exactly how we need to do. We need to show the ones that are doing the bad things that we really mean that it's not okay, but also to, I think you mentioned it a little before, also to elevate those who actually do good things so we can learn from them and, and see how they're working. So good comment. Yeah. Uh, we actually do have a segment where we give sunshine to people uh, okay. or initiatives or organizations of any other kind is there any industry uh, or is there any anything is there anything or anyone you would like to uh, send your sunshine to i want to send my sunshine to um people that run orphanages that's what i like to how come you know most of us live in good household family and you know we always came home to some mom and dad and we don't we take it for granted you know 
if you if you ever go on the safari and you look at the animals, even the animals like to be in families. It's like a, it's a thing of life. So when you think about orphans and they don't have a family and somebody has to take care of it and substitute for family, I think it's a tough job. Mm. So I talk enough about it, but I think it's one of the toughest jobs is to convince a kid that it's okay, that even if they don't have parents around, it's okay, and then make them into a proper human that then will participate in making the world a better place. So when I think about I know people talk about healthcare workers and so yeah, I understand that too. Mm. But our and always been for years. I think that you're telling a very compelling story here and uh, uh, thank you for thank you for elevating them, definitely. We're coming to an end, my friend Theo. If you would uh, summarize today's conversations, what would you say? I would say that based on the questions you're telling me, we need to educate people more and more about not only where the metals and the non-metals are coming from, but also to, to educate them about the power they have to affect change in how we're sourcing the metals. Because people think that they just, um, they don't have power, they do have power in the choices they make. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think mining metals is going to always be critical. There's no energy transition without mining the metals. It's not going to happen. We need to mine these metals to actually move to the next level to make the switch, like you, like you call the show. But that switch also requires the consumers to make the switch in how they're picking and choosing things. Uh, that use mining and metal, basically engineers, computers, appliances, all of that, that are critical to society. So listeners and watchers and viewers out there, you heard it from Theo. It's in your hands. You can affect the situation. Thank you, Theo, for raising the awareness on this issue. I really think that it was uh, well needed. M many people understand uh, how actually my, uh, mining in metals uh, affect everything we do. So thank you for spreading that awareness, from educating us and entertaining us, and uh, for being here at The Switch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome. Uh, you who have been listening to this episode, I hope you like this. Uh, make sure to share it because the absolute best thing we can do is to share good content with each other, to educate each other and to entertain each other. Subscribe to our podcast and please comment, be engaged in our communication so we get to know more about what you want. Uh, here. Until I see you next time, take care of yourself and if you can, someone else. See ya!